Hi, um, welcome back to this course on infrastructure finance. Uh, this is lecture 39 and uh, we will continue our discussion on uh, trying to understand uh, the context of infrastructure development. Uh, we have been looking at uh, the power sector in the previous class. Uh, in this lecture, we will try and look at the uh, road sector. But before we actually do that, let us try and spend some time to discuss the uh, thought questions that we had at the end of the previous lecture. Uh, we actually had two questions, but um, I had actually uh, asked you to do a homework uh, in the middle of the uh, lecture on uh, written on assets of uh, different types of um, power corporations. So we will try and discuss them one by one. Uh, the first uh, uh, the, the task is um, you know, to find out the written on assets on uh, different uh, types of power corporations. So remember, if you actually look at it, um, we had um, uh, discussed that there are three, four, three broad types of uh, power generation, conventional power generation, hydro, thermal, and uh, nuclear. And uh, we had looked at uh, the net income or the profit percentage for each of these corporations. And uh, we also discussed that um, you know, the cost of uh, the capacity cost for power generation in each of these uh, uh, three types of corporation are going to be very different. Um, uh, thermal power corporation is probably has the lowest uh, capacity cost and nuclear is probably has the highest capacity cost. And uh, we said uh, we have to find out uh, the return on assets for each of these corporations because the cost of installing um, uh, you know, unit uh, capacity is going to be uh, very different for each of those uh, three types of uh, power generation. And uh, when you actually look at it, um, I have uh, given the total assets uh, for each of the you know, power corporations. And if you assume that uh, substantial uh, part of the assets is for uh, cost of power generation installed capacity, and uh, we can kind of uh, you know do the return on assets to find out. Uh, what is uh, you know how how effect, how efficient uh, of each of these uh, corporations are? So as expected, uh, you will find uh, the National Thermal Power Corporation has the highest return on assets of nine percent, uh, indicating that on the cost of installing uh, unit capacity of a thermal generation plant is probably uh, the lowest uh, because if you assume that power generated by all the three corporations are sold at uh, very similar rates and um, if the cost of capacity installation is different then um, return on assets is a measure of uh, you know how uh, which of them is going to be uh, the competitive in terms of installing uh, capacity costs. So if ROA is an indicator of how cheap uh, it is to install capacity uh, in each of those uh, types of power generation, we find NTPC is probably uh, the cheapest uh, 9 percent and the NHPC has a ratio of uh, 6 percent and then nuclear power corporation has a ratio of 4 percent. So essentially um, if you assume that all the three corporations perform uh, the same level of efficiency, uh, all three are public sector corporations. So the only differentiating factor between them could be the cost of, gen the cost of installing uh, unit capacity of power generation. So therefore, this is an indicator that nuclear capacity is going to be the highest and thermal capacity is going to be the lowest cost. We can also look at the uh, asset turnover. Asset turnover is nothing but the ratio of sales divided by total assets. That is how much of um, assets uh, how much of investment, investment is assets is needed to generate a uh, given amount of revenues. Again you find um, NTPC is actually having the highest ratio. So indicating that the total asset investment needed is the lowest for uh, thermal capacity and it is probably uh, you know we need a high amount of investment in assets in hydro and uh, nuclear. Okay. So the question that you might have is when uh, thermal is probably uh, you know, having the highest asset turnover, having the highest return on assets, why as a country we want to actually look at hydro and nuclear power because they are probably more expensive. So the reason is, uh, you know, it is not only the cheapest uh, that uh, we always look at in terms of power generation, but we need to be really not dependent on uh, one single source of power. So tomorrow example, let us say if coal 
um, is in short supply, then uh, we might need to actually uh, look at other forms of uh, power, other sources for power generation that is one. Uh, second um, is there are other benefits, uh, let us say for example, nuclear power corporation helps us to develop uh, nuclear technology and in the long run, uh, nuclear generation is supposed to be uh, you know very clean and today most of the uh, developed countries are actually going for uh, increasing the emphasis on nuclear generation simply because it is supposed to be environmentally um, you know much more superior as compared to uh, thermal power because of the fact that it does not result in any harmful emissions. So, there is, uh, there is a policy angle also to actually look at uh, generating power from different sources and um, so for the time being um, we need to be really looking at developing different sources of power because from a long term perspective uh, we may be able to uh, capture uh, much more benefits uh, that way. So, the second question that we had is what is an important feature of electricity production that impacts investment in the sector. So, unlike other products where uh, we can produce uh, and then store it for use it later. In the case of electricity inventory of uh, power that has been generated is not economically uh, feasible even today. Let us say for example, uh, in terms of agriculture uh, we produce a crop and then store it for use during the remainder of the year. So, whatever is produced can be stored and then used at a later period. Let us say in the case of automobiles, we produce cars and then we store it before it is actually being sold. But in the case of electricity, uh, what is important is uh, it cannot be inventory, that is it cannot be produced and then stored before it can be used at a, a later stage or at least it cannot be done in a, an economical fashion. I mean we still actually are able to store electricity, uh, but it is in a very, very mini minimal fashion. For example, today we are able to store electricity in batteries. Uh, so, that is very, very small proportion of the total power consumption that we actually use for. So, therefore, it is important for us to actually have electricity capacity to the extent that there is a demand. And in the previous lecture, we also discussed that uh, demand is uh, highly fluctuating in the sense that um, if you look at a particular day. So, we said that. Uh, on the x axis this is your time of day and then the y axis we have demand for power. So, normally you find uh, uh, a peak in demand for power twice during the day corresponding to uh, the early morning um, office uh, rush hour and then in the evening when people come back homes and then uh, they need electricity for cooking and lighting and all the other purposes right. So, essentially you find the demand is not consistent, the demand fluctuates and there are certain specific peaks. So, now if you want to meet the electricity demand during this peak hours then we need, uh, we need uh, so much of capacity uh, to meet the demand. And this capacity which is needed during the peak hours remains idle at the remaining part of the day. So, therefore, this is an asset that is not being productively used for, uh, for a long, uh, for a large duration during the day and um, so therefore, uh, it actually is in, in some sense uh, an investment that probably is being uh, underutilized. Now, what can we actually do? Uh, what can we actually do to uh, reduce this peak? Okay? And if you do not really have uh, enough capacity to meet the, the peak load. Uh, demand, then obviously people go for what is called as uh, you know uh, 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 shutdowns. Um, there is uh, you know dedicated uh, in some case there is uh, you know dedicated power cutoff uh, during these peak hours to ensure that uh, the load is uh, the load is kind of balanced the remainder part of the day. Let us say for example, if people know that there is going to be a power shutdown for a particular duration, then what are they going to do? They are going to schedule their task uh, during the uh, remaining period. So, in effect what happens uh, the peak gets distributed uh, during the, uh, the remainder of the time zone. Right? So, in India if you do not have capacity um, we are able to kind of enforce shutdowns, but that is not the case in uh, most developed countries. In developed countries uh, they actually use other forms to encourage, uh, to encourage uh, uh, power consumption in the 
or uh, to basically reduce the, uh, the peaks, uh, demand peaks. So, the, how they do it, they have something called as a time of the day pricing. That is, when you actually consume power during peak hours, then the cost of power um, is going to be uh, quite high as compared to consumption of power during the uh, remaining time periods. Uh, that is also natural because um, the cost of uh, power uh, at, uh, at peak load is going to be higher. So, therefore, the tariffs also in line with the uh, cost of power that is being generated. Okay? So, therefore, there are different ways in which we can actually minimize uh, uh, these peaks. Uh, basically either in terms of shutdowns or in terms of uh, demand side management. We manage the demand in such a way uh, so that uh, the peaks can be uh, reduced. So, for example, uh, if you actually use some ways to reduce the peaks, then the overall power demand can be something like this. Right? Overall power demand can be something like this. You may still have some peaks, but then the sharpness of the peaks can be uh, uh, reduced and distributed during the other times. Okay, the next question that we had was, uh, the many infrastructure companies in India have a holding company structure. What is an advantage of this structure? Okay. Uh, first of all, let us try and understand uh, what is a holding company structure. So, you have what is called as your holding company. Okay. We have what is called as your holding company. Let us assume that this company is involved in uh, setting up power plants. And this holding company has, let us say, two subsidiary corporations, right? two subsidiary corporations. And one corporation is, in, is involved in uh, you know, the business of setting up power plants in a, a regulated setting. Okay? So, let us call it as your regulated setting, regulated uh, setting. So, in a regulated setting, uh, you have regulation on how much can be the tariffs, what will be the returns and so on. And then you have another corporation which is in an unregulated setting, right? unregulated setting. So, an unregulated setting means there is no regulation, it is open to the market competition. So, essentially you are talking about uh, merchant power plants. Okay? So, a regulated company is probably involved in setting up of independent power plants and then an unregulated setting is involved in setting up of uh, merchant power plants. And let us assume that there are two project finance companies under each of the subsidiary corporations. So, I will call them as project 1 and then call them as project 2. Then we call them as let us say project 3 call them as project 4. So, now this is something called as a holding company structure. The holding company, the holding company does not own any assets, but it is actually an investor into subsidiary corporations, which one of it operates in a regulated setting, the other operates in an unregulated setting. And there are in turn two project finance companies under each of the subsidiary corporations. Okay? So, this is also called as a hybrid structure, a hybrid structure because we also have a project finance um, arrangement and we also have a corporate finance arrangement. So, this is a project finance arrangement and this is your corporate finance arrangement. Since we have both um, in the same um, you know, corporation, we call this also a hybrid structure. Okay? So, now let us say for example, uh, uh, you have um, project 1 and project 2, they are IPPs. Uh, in the case of IPPs, you actually have contracts and therefore, um, the risk is much lower. So, you are able to actually have, let us say, an 80 percent leverage, right? You are able to have an 80 percent leverage. And then the project 3 and project 4 are merchant power plants, there is um, higher level of risk. So, therefore, the leverage that you can have is only uh, 50 percent, right? The leverage you can have is only 50 percent. And let us say at the corporation level, the subsidiary corporation level, we are talking about uh, 50 percent leverage, talking about 50 percent leverage in both the cases. And then at the holding company level, let us assume that there is your uh, 60 percent uh, leverage, 60 percent leverage. 
Now let us see if you assume uh, you know some hypothetical capital numbers, let us say at the holding company level uh, there is um, equity of 40 and the company borrows debt to the extent of 60, so the total capital is 100 at the holding company level, right. So the sponsors of the holding company bring in 40, they borrow 60, the total capital available is 100 and the holding company makes investments um, in let us say the uh, regulated entity and the unregulated entity in an equal manner. So out of the total capital of 100, it invests 50 in a regulated uh, company and 50 in the unregulated company. So this 50 investment from the holding company uh, is actually in the form of equity in the uh, regulated entity, right. So and this 100 gets divided into um, equity of 50 in the regulated entity and another equity of 50 in the unregulated and using this equity of 50, uh, the regulated entity can borrow another 50 because we are talking about a 50 percent leverage. So the regulated entity borrows uh, another 50, right. So the total capital available with the subsidiary corporation is 100 and same here with the using this equity of 50, the unregulated entity borrows another 50, so the total capital available is 100. Uh, in the case of an unregulated entity. So here we have uh, let us say a total capital of 100, we have a total capital of 100 and obviously this regulated entity is investing in two projects and this 100 is getting invested at the rate of 50 each in both the projects, okay. So we are talking about uh, 50 in project 1 and 50 in project 2, okay. So this 50 is a equity contribution of the regulated company in project 1, okay. And this 50 is the equity contribution of the regulated entity in project 2. And we are talking about 80 percent leverage, right, we are talking about 80 percent leverage. So using this 50, the company can therefore borrow, using the 50, the company can therefore borrow 200. So the company can actually make an investment in project which can be constructed using a capital of 250, okay. So for project 2, there is equity of 50 and then we have a debt of 200 again. So the total capital available for project 2 is uh, 250. Now if you assume the same thing for the unregulated entity, in project 3 and project 4, project 3 and project 4, the unregulated entity has a total capital of 100, it invests 50 in both project 3 and project 4 as equity and then the leverage is 50 percent for project 3 and project 4, so therefore the debt that they can borrow will be so the total capital for project 3 and project 4 is this 100 each. So they can actually implement a project for about an investment of 100 each. So now the question I have for you is what is the total leverage for this entire structure? What is the total leverage for this entire structure? So first we will have to um, find out what is the a uh, total borrowing that has actually happened, what is the total amount of borrowing that has actually happened from outside. So what is the borrowing that has happened, let us actually go from the uh, bottom of the pyramid, okay. So you have debt of 200 in project 1, you have debt of 200 in project 2, the, so the total borrowing from project 1 and project 2 is uh, 400 and project 3 and project 4 we have debt of 50 each. So the total borrowing uh, for project 3 and project 4 will be 100, okay. So the borrowings for all the projects put together will be 400 plus 100 that will be 500, right. Borrowing, total borrowing will be 
500 at the project level plus then we find there is a borrowing at the uh, regulated setting right regulated company borrows 50 and the unregulated company borrows 50 so at the subsidiary corporation level there is a total borrowing of 100 that is 50 plus 50, that is a then we come to the holding company level at the holding company level there has been a borrowing of 60 okay so the total borrowing is will be 660 right will be 660 what is the equity the original equity that has come in for the entire structure is only the 40 right this is only this 40 this is the original equity that has come in so the remaining is just a cascading of the original equity in the different entities okay so the original equity is only original equity is only 40 so the total capital is 700 right the total capital is uh, 700 so therefore the leverage is nothing but 660 divided by 700 and this will approximately equal to about 94 okay. So, we have a very high degree of leverage when we use a holding company structure and this is one of the, the biggest advantages of using this kind of a structure. Why? Because we have seen earlier when we increase debt, we are able to reduce the uh, cost of capital and um, this actually helps us to uh, generate power at much more competitive rate simply because the cost of debt is lower as compared to the cost of equity. So, when you look at many of the Indian um, companies in the infrastructure sector like GMR or GVK or any such companies, most of them will have this kind of a holding company structure where they have a large number of subsidiary project companies. Okay? So, one, one of the reasons why they do it is basically to increase the, the leverage that they have in the entire structure. Okay, now, we will go to the uh, topic of uh, today's lecture which is to really understand a uh, little bit about uh, the road sector. So, India has one of the largest uh, road networks in the world. Uh, you know if I am right I think uh, uh, US is probably has the world's largest uh, uh, road network uh, followed by China and then uh, next comes India. Okay. And um, so, roads actually in India play an important uh, you know position in the uh, transportation matrix. Though we have different forms of transport, uh, uh, you have air transport and within surface transport you have road, rail and water and so on. Um, you know roads actually is important uh, position uh, because they, 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 they estimated to carry 65 percent of the freight and about 85 percent of the uh, passenger traffic. So, you know for, for economic growth and development uh, therefore, it becomes very important to actually have very strong road infrastructure. If you look at uh, the road network in India, they are broadly classified into four different categories. You know, on the top of it, you have the national highways, which is actually um, uh, uh, very important roads um, that are actually managed by the uh, central government. And then you have uh, state highways, which are actually managed by the uh, state government. And uh, you also have other roads such as district roads and then village roads. Uh, all of this also will come under the um, uh, purview of the state government. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, in terms of the quality, in terms of the length, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know um, the strength of the network, uh, obviously um, it decreases as we go from national highways to uh, village roads. National highways are probably you know, much more uh, well built as compared to the village roads. So how do we actually fund um, the road network in India? Okay. So really look at it. Uh, there's been uh, largely uh, you know, three or four sources. So, the first is, is what is called as the, the fuel cess. So, in India, whenever we actually buy a fuel, uh, petrol or diesel, we actually pay uh, a cess, and uh, a part of the cess is actually used for uh, road development. Okay? Uh, so, today the rate of cess is uh, 2 rupees per liter of petrol or diesel, and this 2 rupees is actually goes to a cesspool, and um, from this cesspool, uh, we are actually distributed to uh, different road projects. Let us say, for example, out of this uh, 2 rupees, uh, 50 paise goes to uh, uh, national highway uh, projects. 
and then out of the remaining 150, you know, the cess that is being received from diesel um, goes to uh, some state highway projects and then the remaining goes for uh, rural roads and so on and so forth. But you now what I am really trying to say here is um, you know, each and every road user uh, indirectly uh, pays for the development of the road sector in India because of this um, uh, fuel cess. Okay. And the second is uh, your budgetary outlays. So, you have uh, let us say uh, budgetary outlays from the government of India through its annual process and the government allocates a certain amount of money in terms of um, uh, for road development. And then you have what is called as your uh, EAP external assistance programs. Okay? And uh, the external assistance programs are uh, let us say the, the, the grants of the capital that uh, you know the government receives from external agencies such as the World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank and then the Japanese Bank for International Cooperation and so on. So, if you really look at uh, the budget or the economic survey, we find that um, you know World Bank, Asian Development Bank and uh, the Japanese Bank for International Cooperation has contributed uh, to the uh, road development sector in India. And then we talk about uh, you know private capital, uh, private capital it could be in terms of uh, Know, equity investment or it could be in terms of uh, debt. So, let us say using the uh, capital that the government provides, um, some of the public sector organizations can go ahead and raise money from the uh, public market. So, this is this market borrowings and market borrowings also so certain extent can consider as a part of your uh, private capital. So, this is uh, uh, by and large uh, uh, funding of the, uh, the Indian uh, road sector. Um, there was a recent estimate, uh, you know, which uh, talked about um, um, a total funding requirement. So, in 2004, um, government estimated the total funding requirement um, for road sector development for the period 2005-06 to 2011-12. Right? So, the total funding requirement, uh, total funding requirement. Uh, during this period um, as of 2004 prices uh, was estimated at uh, 172,000 um, uh, crores. Right. So, if you really look at this substantial uh, part of the um, capital and right, this is substantial part of the capital and out of that um, uh, private uh, private investment right private sources private investment is supposed to be about um, uh, 75,000 crores. And then we have other forms uh, which includes uh, CES, uh, external assistance, budgetary outlays and market borrowings. All of them put together um, the remaining that I have talked about, CES pool, uh, market borrowings, external assistance and all of this put together it is about uh, 97,000 crores. Okay. So, essentially if you look at it, uh, you know government envisages a substantial part of road development uh, to be assumed by the private sector in the ongoing uh, in the in the in the in the future years okay. so essentially um, you really look at um, you know bulk of this private sector is largely in the uh, national highway sector because national highways uh, sector carries a lot of traffic um, and uh, this makes them a commercially viable proposition for the private investors. So, private investors can charge tolls and uh, they will be able to um, get return on their investment as well as to also uh, recover their investment that they have actually made. Okay. And um, um, you know originally uh, uh, you know the national highways in India was actually uh, under the National Highway Authority of India and National Highway Authority of India has developed several plans. So, you have the National Highway Development Plan. So, today you have National Highway Development Plan 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. Right? And um, it is envisaged that um, you know all uh, investment um, in uh, going forward is going to be uh, using private sector investment in the National Highway Development Plan. Uh, Let us really look at uh, the financial structure of uh, uh, National Highway Authority of India. So, I have actually um, taken it from uh, you know the uh, economic survey and uh, if you really look at it um, you know we talk about different types of sources you know it indicates there is a CES fund, CES fund is what I have actually uh, talked about and uh, if you look at it uh, there is a big jump uh, in the CES fund from 2005-06 to 2006-07. Okay, so, the reason is um, in 2006 uh, the government uh, uh, you know levied an additional CES of 50 paise per litre. Uh, of petrol and diesel 
and uh, which was directly allocated for the uh, national highway development. So the earlier the CIS was uh, 1.5 rupees, um, which was um, allocated for uh, the road, road, road network development, and uh, with the with with an increase of another 50 paise, it actually became 2 rupees. And then the entire 50 paise that was actually charged was direct was completely allocated for um, national highway development. So that was the reason why there has been a sudden jump uh, in the CIS fund uh, in 2006-7. And then we talk about external assistance. Um, the external assistance um, uh, from World Bank and ADB that can come in two forms. Uh, it can come in terms of grant and it can also be in terms of loan. So the normally the external assistance is for projects uh, to develop roads. Uh, in um, areas that are not easily accessible, it could be hilly areas, it could be areas that were not very well developed and so on. So generally look at it, uh, these are essentially from a development perspective, not really in terms of an investment. So therefore, uh, the proportion of grant is always higher than a proportion of the loan component. Okay? Grant component indicates that there's a one-time investment uh, more uh, as a way to encourage, um, uh, stimulate development uh, in these uh, underdeveloped areas. And then you also have uh, borrowings, uh, NHAI borrows uh, using the CES fund, it actually leverages the CES fund and borrows additional capital from the market. So we can actually make investments in terms of uh, different bonds that NHAI, um, in, that NHAI uh, you know, um, uh, uses to raise money. For example, you have the capital gains bonds, you have the tax-free bonds and so on. So uh, the NHAI raises money from the market, uh, borrows money in terms of issue, by issuing bonds. And then over and above that we have also called as your budgetary support. So government of India during this annual budget allocates a certain amount of capital uh, towards National Highway Authority of India. Okay? So this is the broad source of funding for development of national highways, broad sources from, um, from the public sector. So now let us really look at uh, uh, PPP in uh, roads. Okay? Uh, traditionally. Uh, the government was responsible for uh, road development, but um, you know, given the fact that, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the total funding requirement for road development was very large, and obviously the government was felt that it is not in a position to meet all the capital requirements by itself, and uh, therefore they wanted to actually tap into private sector, and therefore to enable, uh, facilitate, and uh, private sector investment in the road sector, the National Highway Act was amended in 1995. And after this amendment, uh, we have been actually having uh, private sector investment in the road projects in a significant way. So if you really look at it, uh, the private sector roads in India is not really um, you know, very long. It is probably less than 20 years uh, since we have been actually having very active uh, private sector roads. Um, road PPP projects can be broadly classified into uh, two categories. Uh, generally, most of the road PPP projects are having a build, operate, transfer kind of a structure. So the build, operate, transfer structure has two variants. One is uh, BOT toll and the other is your BOT annuity. Okay. So let me actually explain um, the major differences between these uh, two types of uh, PPP projects. If you look at a BOT uh, toll project, what happens? Uh, the private concessioner, um, you know, develops a road, makes the initial investment, and um, is also responsible for maintenance of the road during the uh, during the concession period. And then uh, the private, uh, you know, the private uh, investor is has the right to collect tolls from the users of the road. Okay, so. The, the investor is expected to get a return on uh, their investment using the toll collection revenues. And there will also be other revenue collections, uh, other source of revenues, for example, uh, you know, you are able to have uh, right of way for uh, display of advertisements. Sometimes you also actually have rights for real estate development around the, uh, uh, around the road area and so on. But then uh, primarily uh, most, of the, uh, uh, most of the benefit are uh, returns are in terms of uh, toll collection. So that is your BOT toll. So in the case of a BOT annuity, what happens is um, there is no toll collection, but the private sector makes an investment, and um, uh, therefore uh, it is also responsible for maintenance of the uh, road network, road 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 stretch, and uh, to enable to recover um, the uh, investment, uh, the government uh, pays an annuity uh, revenue stream during the uh, concession period. So this annuity revenue stream um, helps the private investor to recover the uh, investment uh, made uh, by them. So uh, the public sector can 
either collect tolls uh, from the users of the road and then pay them as annuity uh, to the private investor or the private uh, the public sector can um, say that this road is actually been constructed uh, for development perspective and therefore need not collect any tolls may not collect any tolls at just pay uh, reg annuity payments at um, regular intervals to the uh, private investor in the case of a bot toll uh, there are two important um, you know uh, concepts that uh, uh, you may have to be aware of the first is called as your uh, viability uh, gap funding Remember, whenever a private investor has to um, invest, uh, uh, you know, he has to bring in certain amount of capital and um, he needs to actually get a return on the capital that is uh, invested. Okay? So, remember private capital has, um, the cost of capital uh, is going to be higher as compared to public sector capital. So, therefore, if the entire investment is from private sector capital, then for them to actually um, get a return on their investment, the tolls would have to be charged uh, very high. At uh, such high toll rates, you know, there may not be many users who are going to use the project. So, therefore, um, the traffic will be very less and if the traffic is less, then uh, the corresponding economic development uh, will also be uh, lower. Okay? So, the, therefore, the government said that um, the government will provide assistance up to 40 percent of the uh, project cost. Okay? So, if say of the total capital, if a certain amount of capital is going to come from the public sector, then the cost of capital for uh, is going to be reduced and the private sector needs to get a return um, on the investment that only it has made. So, therefore, the toll or uh, the toll rates that are going to be charged can also be correspondingly lower. And um, at this lower rates of toll, the road becomes uh, viable. Okay? The road becomes viable because the private sector is able to get a return on um, the investment that is being uh, made by him. So, therefore, this is called as your viability gap funding. So, that is a funding provided by the public sector which makes the project viable for the private sector. Right? So, that is your viability gap funding. Then the second uh, concept that you have to be aware of is called as your negative grant. So, in a viability gap funding, the public sector provides a grant to the private sector and in a negative grant, it is a reverse. That is, the private sector pays a fee to the public sector for constructing, developing and operating the road. Okay, here, because there may be some stretches of the road which probably are commercially attractive because of the fact that uh, uh, the traffic. Um, the traffic forecaster uh, can be very large and uh, the private sector will be able to collect toll revenues um, that can provide very attractive returns and uh, it may not need any viability support from the government and over and above that it may actually get excess returns on their investment. So, therefore, they share a part of that excess return to the public sector in order to obtain the concession. So, that is your negative grant. The private sector provides uh, capital, um, provides um, certain uh, provides, a, provides let us say a fee to the government for uh, obtaining the uh, concession. So, that is your uh, negative grant. Okay, so, there are many projects uh, that have been awarded uh, where the private sector has actually paid a negative grant to the uh, public sector. So, some of the projects that um, I have indicated uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this slide. So, if you really look at it, um, um, there are some projects um, which actually have um, very high negative grant. Say, for example, if you look at the National Highway Development Plan Phase Five, Baruch and Vadadra, um, which is basically about 83 kilometer stretch, and um, Larson and Tubro, um, the concessioner, um, has actually paid a negative grant of 471 crores to the government simply because um, the concessioner feels that um, this is going to be a very attractive um, road stretch and probably has a, a very high potential for um, toll collection and therefore, in order to uh, get the contract, um, the, con the concessionaire is actually, the contractor is actually paying a negative grant to the uh, public sector. Um, same is uh, with another stretch, uh, uh, Baruch and Surat, uh, the length is being 65 kilometers and uh, IDAA infrastructure has actually given um, a negative grant of uh, 504 crores to the, um, to the public sector. So, there are other, other projects as well which actually have uh, different levels of negative grants that the uh, projects have made. 
Okay, the government has provided various incentives uh, to encourage uh, private sector investment uh, in the road sector. Uh, for example, uh, the government has agreed to bear the cost of a project feasibility study. So, for example, initially before we actually throw it open for bidding, uh, the feasibility of the project has to be obtained and um, the government has agreed to bear the cost of feasibility study. For somebody who is actually uh, involved in initial development of the project, he will incur a lot of costs in terms of establishing the feasibility and so on and so forth and um, the government will reimburse the cost of this initial uh, project feasibility study. And then uh, the government will have to uh, provide the land for the right of way and also for other wayside amenities. The cost of this will actually be borne by the government. Let us say for example, um, there are some uh, utilities uh, that actually um, uh, uh, need, to be dis need to be moved. For example, there could be water lines, there could be telecommunication lines. So, uh, any cost associated with the shifting of the utilities will also be uh, borne by the government. So, the private uh, investor does not really have to bear, bear this additional cost. Then um, the environmental clearances and cutting of trees and all of these things will also be borne by the government. So, essentially the government is trying to uh, make the entire process of private sector investment simple by giving uh, various incentives. The second is, uh, since objective of the government is to actually attract private sector investment, um, the government is uh, thrown it open for foreign direct investment. So, 100 percent of the investment in road sector uh, can come from foreign direct investment. Remember, we do not really have, um, you know, not many sectors uh, in the infrastructure sector uh, can we actually have such large amounts of foreign direct investment uh, uh, to 100 percent. And then we have provision of subsidy up to 40 percent of the project cost to make projects viable. So, this is what we talked about um, the viability gap funding. Uh, government will provide uh, part of the capital of the project cost if needed to make the project viable for the uh, private sector. And then there is a very attractive tax exemption as well and um, 100 percent uh, tax exemption and any consecutive 10 years or 20 years after commissioning of the project. So, that means uh, uh, it is not that uh, this exemption is there for the first 10 years after commissioning, right. The private sector has the flexibility to decide when it wants to actually claim this tax exemption. It can be for any 10 years, it can be from year 5 to year 14 or it can be from year 11 to uh, year 20. So, it can decide depending on what is beneficial for uh, it need not be immediately after the commissioning of the project. And the government is also encouraged uh, and the government is also uh, made uh, imports uh, less expensive by allowing uh, duty free import of um, high capacity and modern road construction equipment if this needs to be imported. And um, by reducing uh, the duty, uh, duties on imports, the government has actually also reduced the cost for the uh, private sector. And then the government has also relaxed norms for external commercial borrowing. You know, external commercial borrowing means that we are actually borrowing from uh, foreign markets. So, when we are actually borrowing from foreign markets, obviously there is going to be um, a cash outflow uh, when the loan is being repaid. So, therefore, uh, external commercial borrowings are um, highly regulated as compared to uh, domestic borrowings. Uh, given the fact that it actually plays uh, impacts the uh, you know foreign exchange reserves of the uh, country. But uh, to encourage um, private investment in the infrastructure sector and also to attract uh, foreign capital, the government has uh, liberalized the external commercial borrowings norm for the uh, road sector. And then um, you know the government has also provided the right to collect tolls and retain the toll revenues by the private sector. And not only that, um, you know there are clauses which uh, ensures that the toll rates are indexed to the wholesale price index. So, that means the private investor need not uh, actually approach the government for uh, regular uh, toll increases. Um, the tolls can automatically be increased based on the changes in your wholesale price index as per uh, regular intervals indicated in the concession agreement. Okay, now, let us really look at um, the performance of PPP roads and non-PPP roads. Okay, so, some of it is basically uh, based on the research that we have done at IIT Madras and um, so this table indicates uh, some uh, differences between PPP and non-PPP road projects. So, remember, when we talk about uh, road sector development, it is not that all the roads are going to be developed by um, PPP mode. Now, we are also going to have road sector development on a non-PPP basis. So, we try and compare and then see what has been uh, the performance of PPP road projects as compared to the public sector road projects. 
So we looked at it on uh, uh, three dimensions. The first is your road length. So if you look at uh, road length, PPP projects are much longer stretches as compared to public sector projects. So the median uh, PPP road length is about 73 kilometers, whereas in the public, the public project, uh, the median road length is uh, about uh, less than 40 kilometers. So uh, private sector is able to develop uh, long stretches. So that means they have the management uh, capability to develop uh, long roads. And look at the total road uh, project cost. The total project cost uh, of a PPP road is uh, higher as compared to uh, public project, naturally because uh, they are actually developing um, a longer road projects. So therefore, the project costs are also expected to be higher. And um, if you look at the unit project cost, so unit project cost is we actually cost per lane kilometer right? because that is an appropriate way to actually calculate. Because if you cannot, if you can calculate cost per kilometer, different roads have different lanes. And normally, the the cost of developing a six lane road is going to be higher than a cost of developing a four lane road. So therefore, a unit project cost, we looked at it in terms of per lane kilometer and uh, a PPP project had a lower uh, per lane kilometer cost as compared to uh, a public project. Hmm? Uh, PPP project had uh, 40.28 um, and then uh, public project had 45.07 in terms of a uh, unit project cost. Remember, if you really look at it, um, in the means, uh, uh, the, the comparison of medians between PPP projects and public projects, they were uh, significant, statistically significant uh, when we use the uh, statistical uh, tests. Okay, now before we actually look at um, some other aspects of uh, uh, you know, PPP and public sector road projects. I have um, a few questions uh, for this lecture. The questions for this lecture is, um, what would be a preferred PPP model for roads? Uh, will it be BOT toll or will it be uh, BOT annuity? Okay. The second question is, uh, we found that unit costs of PPP projects are lower as compared to public sector projects. Right? We saw that um, uh, PPP projects had a cost of about um, 40, uh, whereas in the case of public sector projects, it had a cost of about 45. But when we actually did a regression estimate, which we will probably indicate in the uh, next lecture, in the regression estimate, um, um, you know, we actually see that uh, PPP had an effect of increasing unit project cost. Okay? So if we compare the median project cost for public sector and PPP projects, we find uh, PPP are having um, lower costs, lower unit costs, but when we do a regression estimation, we actually find that uh, PPP is associated with an increasing effect on unit cost. So how can we actually uh, explain this? Okay? How can we actually explain this? So we will discuss these questions in the next lecture.